Hello again, everyone. Um, next chapter or two of Silas Marner by George Eliot. Um, we're oh, two thirds of the way through, I reckon. We're on page 147 out of 215. So yeah, we're uh, we're getting through it, and I'm really enjoying it. I think it's very good, very good read. Um, so we will have a couple of chapters, I reckon, today. Um, I'm just about to pour myself a drink. It's Tempest's The Sky Was Purple, uh, in case you're wondering. So I shall pour that just now. Oh. That's nice. This isn't a beer review. I do do beer reviews over on Twitch. This isn't a beer review, but this is a nice beer. I can tell you that right now. It's a bit of a... But the heady one, another. Mm. Delicious. Right. Chapter 14. There was a pauper's burial that week in Ravelo, and up Kenji Yard at Batherley, it was known that the dark haired woman with the fair child, who had lately come to lodge there, was gone away again. That was all the express note taken that Molly had disappeared from the eyes of men. But the un but the underwept death sorry, the unwept death, which to the general lot seemed as trivial as the summer shed leaf, was charged with the force of destiny to certain human lives that we know of, shaping their joys and sorrows even to the end. Silas Marner's determination to keep the tramp's child was a matter of hardly less surprise and iterated talk in the village than the robbery of his money. That softening of feeling towards him, which dated from his misfortune, that merging of suspicion and dislike in a rather contemptuous pity for him as lone and crazy, was now accompanied with the more active sympathy, especially among the women. Notable mothers, who knew what it was to keep children whole and sweet, lazy mothers who knew what it was to be interrupted in folding their arms and scratching their elbows by the mischievous propensities in children just firm on their legs were equally interested in conjecturing how a lone man would manage with a two-year-old child in his hands and were equally ready with their suggestions the notable chiefly telling him what he had better do and the lazy ones being emphatic in telling him what he would never be able to do <laughs> among the notable women Notable mothers, Dolly Winthrop was the one whose neighbourly offices were the most acceptable to Marner, for they were rendered without any show of bustling instruction. Silas had shown her the half guinea given to him by Godfrey, and asked her what she what he should do about getting some clothes for the child. Eh, Mr Marner, said Dolly, there's no call to buy no more nor a pair of shoes, for I've got the little petticoats as Aaron wore five years ago and it's ill spending the money on them baby clothes for the child will grow like grassy may bless it that it will and the same day dolly brought her bundle and displayed to marner one by one the tiny garments in their due order of succession most of them patched and darned but clean and neat as fresh spring as fresh sprung herbs this was the introduction to a great ceremony with soap and water from which baby came out in new beauty and sat on dolly's knee handling her toes and chuckling and patting her, her palms together with an air of having made several discoveries about herself, which she communicated by alternate sounds of gug, 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 and mammy. The mammy was not a cry of need or uneasiness. Baby had been used to utter it without expecting either tender sound or touch to follow. Anybody would think the angels in heaven couldn't be prettier, said Dolly, rubbing the golden curls and kissing them. And to think of its being covered with them dirty rags, and the poor mother froze to death. But there's them as took care of it and brought it to our door, Master Marner. The door was open, and it walked in over the snow, like as if it had been starved little Robin, uh, little starved Robin. Don't you say the door was open? Yes, said Silas meditatively. Yes, the door was open. The money's gone, I don't know where, and this has come from I don't know where. He had not mentioned to anyone his unconsciousness of the child's entrance, shrinking from questions which might lead to the fact that he, he himself suspected, namely, that he had been in one of his trances. 
Ah, said Dolly, with soothing, soothing gravity. It's like the night and the morning, and the sleeping and the waking, and the rain and the harvest. One goes and the other comes, and we know nothing how nor where. We may strive and scratch and fend, but it's little we can do after all. The big things come and go, we know striving in an hour, and they do, that they do. And I think that if you're right on it, uh, uh, to keep the little in, Mr. Marner, seeing as it's been sent to you, though there's folks that think different. You'll happen to be a bit moithered with it while it's so little, but I'll come and welcome and see to it for you. I've a bit of time to spare most days, for when one gets up the bed times of the morning, the clock seems to stand still to ten before it's time to go uh, about the victual. So, as I say, I'll come and I'll see the child for you and welcome. Thank you, kindly, said Silas, hesitating a little. I'd be glad if you tell me things, but, he added uneasily, leaning forward to look at Baby with some jealousy, as she was resting her head backwards against Ollie's arm and eyeing him contentedly from a distance, but I want to do things for it myself, else it may get fond of somebody else and not fond of me. I've been learning to... I've been used to fending for myself in the house. I can learn. I can learn. Eh, to be sure, said Dolly, gently. I've seen as men as are wonderful handy with children. The men are awkward and contrary, mostly, God help them. But when the drink's out of them, they aren't unsensible, though they're bad for leeching and badgering. Uh, bandaging, so fiery and un unpatient. You see, this goes first, next to the skin, proceeded Dolly, taking up the little shirt and putting it on. Yes, said Marner, docilely, bringing his eyes very close that they may be uninitiated in the mysteries, whereupon Baby seized his head with both her small arms and put her lips against his face with purring noises. See there, said Dolly, with a woman's tender tact. She's fondest of you. She wants to go onto your lap, but I'll be bound. Go then, take her, Mr. Marner. You can put things on and, and then you can say as you've done for her from the first of her coming to you. Marner took her on his, took her on his lap, trembling with an emotion mysterious to himself as something unknown dawning on his life. Thought and feeling were so confused within him that if he had tried to give them utterance, he could only have said that the child was come inside of the gold instead of the gold, that the gold had turned into a child. He took the garments from Dolly and put them on under her teaching, interrupted, of course, by baby's gymnastics. There, then. Why, you take to it quite easy, Master Marner, said Dolly. But what shall you do when you're forced to sit in your loom? She'll get busier and mischievous every day, she will, bless her. It's lucky as you've got that high hearth instead of great, for that keeps the fire more out of her reach. But if you've got anything as can be spilt or broke or is as fit to cut her fingers off, she'll be at it. And as is it, and it is, excuse me, it is but right you should know. Silas meditated a while, while in some perplexity. I'll tire her to the leg of the loom, he said at last. Tire her with a good long strip or something. Well, mayhap that'll do, as it's a little gal, for they're easy persuaded to sit in one place, nor the lads. I know what the lads are. I've had four. Four I've had, God knows. And if I was to take you, take and tie them up, they'd make a fighting and a crying as if you were ringing pigs. But I'll bring you to my little chair and some bits of red rag and things for her to play with, and she'll sit and chatter to them as if they were alive. Yeah, if it wasn't a sin to the lads to wish and made different, bless them, I should have been glad for one to, for one of them to be a little gal, and to think I could have taught her to scour and mend and the knitting and everything. But I can't teach them the little one, Mr. Marner, when she gets old enough. Sorry, I can teach them to this little one, Mr. Marner, when she gets old enough. But she'll be my little one, said Marner rather hastily. She'll be nobody else's. Oh, no, to be sure. You'll have a right to her if you're a father to her and bring her up according. But, added Dolly, coming to a point which she had been determined beforehand to touch upon, you must bring her up like christened folks' children and take her to church and let her learn her uh, catechise. Catechise? Catech catechism? Catechise, yeah. Uh, as my little Aaron can say off, I, the, I believe and everything and hurt nobody by word or deed as well as if you were the clerk. That's what you must do, Mr. Marner, if you would do the right thing by the orphan child. 
Marner's pale face flushed suddenly under a new anxiety. His mind was too busy trying to give some definite bearing to Dolly's words for him to think of, of answering her. And it's my belief, she went on, as the poor little creature had never been christened, and it's nothing but right as the person should be spoke to. And if you was no ways unwilling, I'd talk to Mr Macy about this very day. For if the child ever went any ways wrong, if you hadn't done your part by it, Mr Master Marner, inoculation and everything to save it from harm, it'd be a thorn in your bed forever on this side of the grave. And I can't think as it'd be easy lying down for anybody when they got to another world if they hadn't done their part by the helpless child as come without their own asking. Dolly herself was supposed to be silent for some time now. I'm glad, frankly. <laughs> for she had spoken from the depths of her own simple belief and was concerned to know whether her words would produce the desired effect on Silas. He was puzzled and anxious for Dolly's word, christened, conveyed no distinct meaning to him. He had only heard of baptism and had only seen the baptism of grown-up men and women. What is you mean by christened, he said at last timidly. Won't folks be good to her without it? Oh, dear, dear, Master Marner, said Dolly with gentle distress and compassion. How do you never know father, no mother has taught you to say your prayers, and as there's good words and good things to keep us from harm? Yes, said Silas in a low voice. I know a deal about that. Used to, used to. But your ways are different. My country was a good way off. He paused for a few moments and then added more decidedly. But I want to do everything as can be done for the child, and whatever's right for it they, in, this, in this country. And you'd think I'll do... Uh, do it good. I'll act according if you tell me. Well then, Master Marner, said Dolly, inwardly rejoicing. I'll ask Mr Macy to speak to the parson about it, and you must fix a name for it, because it must have a name give it when it's christened. Hmm. My mother's name was Hefzibah, said Silas, and my little sister was named after her. Eh, that's a hard name, said Dolly. I partly think it isn't a christened name. It's a Bible name, said Silas, old ideas recurring. Oh, then I've no call to speak again it, said Dolly, rather startled by Silas's knowledge on his head. But you see, I'm no scholar, and if I'm slow at catching the words, my husband said, I'm always like as if I was putting the haft for the handle. That's the way he says, for he's sharp, God help him. But it was awkward calling your little sister by such a hard name when you'd got nothing big to say, like, uh, wasn't it, Master Marner? Oh, we called her Epi, said Silas. Well, if no way's wrong to shorten the name, it'd be a deal handier. And so I'll go now, Master Marner, and I'll speak about the Christmas of christening afore dark, and I wish you the best of luck. And it's my belief as it'll come to you if you do what's right by the orphan child, and there's this inoculation to be seen to. And as to the washing of its bits of things, you need look nobody but but me, for I can do em wi' one hand, and I've got her, uh, and I've got my sods about. Eh, hey, the blessed angel. You'll let me bring my iron one of these days, and he'll show her his cart and his father's made for him, and the black and white puppies he's got a rearing. Need another drink for the next massive paragraph here. I like the way Dolly's written, but it's not easy to uh, to speak her words. Baby was christened. The rector deciding that a double baptism was a lesser risk to occur. And on this occasion, Silas, making himself as clean and tidy as he could, appeared for the first time within the church and shared in the observances held sacred by his neighbours. He was quite unable, by means of anything he saw or heard, to identify the Ravelo religion with his old faith. If he could at any time in his previous life have done so, it must have been by the aid of a strong feeling ready to vibrate with sympathy, rather than by a comparison of phrases and ideas. And now for long years that feeling had been dormant. He had no distinct idea about the baptism and the church going, except that Dolly had said that it was good for the child. And in this way, as the weeks grew to months, the child's cr child created fresh and fresh links between his life and the lives from which he had hitherto shrunk continually into narrower isolation. Unlike the gold which needed nothing and must be worshipped in close-locked solitude, which was hidden away from the daylight, was deaf to the birds of songs and started, no, started to no human tones, 
Epe was a creature of endless claims and ever-growing desires, seeking and loving sunshine and living sounds and living movements, making trial of everything, with trust and new joy and stirring the human kindness in all eyes that looked on her. The gold had kept his thoughts in an ever-repeating circle, leading to nothing beyond itself, but Epi was an object compacted of changes and hopes that forced his thoughts onwards and carried them far from their old, eager pacing towards the same blank limit, carried them away to new things that would come with, uh, with the coming years, when Epi would have learned to understand how her father Silas cared for her and made him look for images of that time in the ties and charities that bound together the families of the neighbours. The gold had asked that he should sit weaving longer and longer, deafened and blinded more and more to all things except the monotony of his loom and the repetition of his web. But Epi called him away from his weaving and made him think it's all pause as a holiday, reawakening his senses with his fresh new life. Even to the old winter flies that came crawling forth in the early spring sunshine and warming him into joy because she had joy. And when the sunshine grew strong and lasting, so that the buttercups were thick in the meadows, Silas might be seen in the sunny midday or in the late afternoon when the shadows were lengthening under the hedgerows, strolling out with uncovered head to carry Epi beyond the stone pits to where the flowers grew, till they reached some favourite bank where he could sit down, and Epi toddled to pluck the flowers, and made remarks to the winged things that murmured happily above the bright petals, calling Dad Dad's attention continually by bringing him the flowers. Then she would turn her ear to some sudden bird note, and Silas leaned to please her by making sign learned to please her by making signs of hushed stillness that they may listen for the note to come again. So that when it came, she set up her small back and laughed and gurg she set up her small back and laughed with gurgling triumph. Sitting on the banks in this way, Silas began to look for the once familiar herbs again, and as the leaves with their unchanged outline and markings lay on his palm, there was a sense of crowding remembrances from which he turned away timidly, taking refuge in Epi's little world that lay, lighted, lay, lay lightly in his enfeebled spirit. As the child's mind was growing into knowledge, his mind was growing into memory. As her life unfolded, his soul, long stupefied in a cold, narrow prison, was unfolding too and trembling gradually into full consciousness. It was an influence which must, have, which must gather force with every new year. The tones that stirred Silas's heart grew articulate and called for more distinct answers. Shapes and sounds grew clearer for Epi's eyes and ears, and there was more that Dad Dad was imperatively required to notice and account for. Also, by the time Epi was three years old, she developed a fine capacity for mischief and for devising ingenious ways of being troublesome, which found much exercise, not only for Silas's patience, but for his watchfulness and penetration. Surely, uh, so sorely was poor Silas pushed on, puzzled on occasions by the incompatible demands of love. Dolly Winthrop told him punishment was good for Epi, and that as for rearing a child without making it tingle, making it tingle a little in soft and safe places now and then, it was not to be done. More drink. That'll make me tingle a little in soft and safe places. To be sure, there's another thing you might do, Master Marner, added Dolly meditatively. You might shut her up once in the coal hall. Coal hole. That was what I did with Aaron, for I, was, for I was that silly with the youngest lad as I could never bear to smack him, nor as I could find my heart to let him stay in the coal hole more than more nor a minute. But it was enough to collie him all over. So as he must be new washed and dressed, and it was as good as a rod to him, that was. But I put it up to your conscience, Mr. Marner. If there's one of them, you must choose either smacking or the coal hole coal hole. She'll never get so masterful. There's no, uh, there'll be no holding her. Silas is impressed by the melancholy truth of this last remark, but the force of his mind failed before the only two penal methods open to him, not only because it was painful to him to hurt Epi, but because he trembled at a moment's contention with her, lest she should love him the less for it. Let even an affectionate Goliath get himself tied to a small tender thing, dreading to hurt it by pulling, and dreading still more to slap, snap the cord, and which of the two, pray, will he master? 
it was clear that Eppie, with her short toddling steps, must lead father Silas a pretty dance on any fine morning when circumstances favoured mischief. For example, he had wisely chosen a broad strip of linen as a means of fastening her to his loom when he was busy. It made a broad belt around her waist and was long enough to allow of her reaching the truckle bed and sitting down on it, but not long enough for her to attempt any dangerous climbing. One bright summer's morning, Silas had been more engrossed than usual in setting up a new piece of work, on occasion on which his scissors were in requisition. These scissors, owing to an especial warning of Dolly's, had been kept carefully out of Eppie's reach, but the click of them had a peculiar attraction for her ear, and watching the results of that click, she had derived the philosophical lesson that the same cause would produce the same effect. Silas had seated himself in his loom and the noise of weaving had begun, but he had left his scissors on a ledge which Eppie's arm was long enough to reach, and now, like a small mouse watching her opportunity, she stole quietly from her corner, secured the scissors and toddled to the bed again, setting her back up as a mode of concealing the fact. She had a distinct intention as to use, as to the use of the scissors, and having cut the linen strip in a jagged but effectual manner, in two moments she had run out the open door when the sunshine was inviting her, while poor, poor Silas believed her to be a better child than usual. It was not until he happened to need his scissors that the terrible fact burst upon him. Eppy had run out by herself and perhaps fallen into the stone pit. Silas, shaken by his worst fear that could have befallen him, rushed out calling Eppy and ran eagerly about the unenclosed space, exploring the dry cavities into which she might have fallen, and then gazing with questioning dread at the smooth red surface of the water. The cold drops stood on his brow. How long had she been out? There was one hope that she had crept through the stile and got into the fields where he habitually took her to stroll, but the grass was high in the meadow, and there was no dis descrying her if there she were except by a close search that would be a trespass on Mr Osgood's crop. Still that misdemeanour must, must be committed, and poor Silas, after peering all round the hedgerows, traversed the grass, beginning, beginning with perturbed vision to see Eppy behind every group of red sorrel, and so to see her moving always farther off as he approached. The meadow was searched in vain, and he got over the stile into the next field, looking with dying hope towards a small pond, which was now reduced to its summer shallowness, so as to leave a wide margin of good adhesive mud. Here, however, sat Eppie, discoursing cheerfully to her own small boot, which she was using as a bucket to convey the water into a deep hoof mark, while her little naked foot was planted comfortably on a cushion of green olive mud. Olive green mud. A red-headed calf was observing her with alarmed doubt through the opposite hedge. I need more drink. Oh, oh, it's exciting. I need more drink. <clears throat> Lovely. Here was clearly a case of aberration in a christened child which demanded severe treatment. But Silas, overcome with convulsive joy at finding his treasure again, could do nothing but snatch her up and cover her with half-sobbing kisses. It was not until he had carried her home and had begun to think of the necessary washing that he recollected the need that he should punish Eppie and make her remember. The idea that she might run away again and come to harm gave him unusual resolution, and for the first time he determined to try the coal hole, a small closet near the hearth. Naughty, naughty Eppie, he began suddenly, holding her on his knee and pointing her to her muddy feet and clothes. Naughty to cut with the scissors and run away. Eppie must go into the coal hole. The coal hole. Why can't I say that? The coal hole. For being naughty. Daddy must put her in the coal hole. He half expected that this would be shock enough and that Eppie would begin to cry. But instead of that, she began to shake herself on his knee, as if the proposition opened a pleasing novelty. Seeing that he must proceed to extremities, he put her into the coal hole and, led, and held the door closed with a trembling sense that he was using a strong measure. For a moment there was silence, but then came a little cry, Opie, Opie, and Silas let her out again, saying, Now, Eppie, I'll never be naughty again, else you must go into the coal hole. 
a black, knotty place. The weaving must stand still a long while while this morning, for now Epi must be washed and have clean clothes on, but it was to be hoped that this punishment would have a lasting effect and save time in future, though perhaps it would have been better if Epi had cried more. In half an hour she was clean again, and Silas, having turned his back to see what he could do with the linen band, threw it down again with the reflection that Epi would be good without fastening for the rest of the morning. He turned round again and was going to place her in her little chair near the loom when he peeped out when she peeped out at him with black face and hands again and said, Epi in the toll hole. This total failure of the coal hole discipline shook Silas's belief in the efficacy of punishment. She'd take it all for fun, he observed to Dolly, if, he, if it, I didn't hurt her, and that I can't do. Mrs. Win uh, that I can't do, Mrs. Winthrop. If she makes me a bit of trouble, I can bear it, and she's got no tricks but what she'll grow out of. Well, that's partly true, Master Marner, said Dolly sympathetically, and if you can't bring your mind to frighten her off touching things, you must do what you can to keep him out of her way. That's what I do with the pups, as our lads and are always a rearing. They will worry and gnaw, worry and gnaw they will. If it was one Sunday's cup, uh, cap as hung anywhere as they could drag it, they know no difference. God help them. It's the punishing of the teeth. It, it's the pushing of the teeth that sets on them. That's what it is. So Epi was reared without punishment. The burden of her misdeeds being borne vicariously by Father Silas. The stone hut was made a soft nest for her, lined with downy patience, and also in the world that lay beyond the stone hut for her, she knew nothing of frowns and denials. Notwithstanding the difficulty of carrying her and his yarn or linen at the same time, Silas took her with him in most of his journeys to the farmhouses, unwilling to leave her behind at Dolly Winthrop's, who was always ready to take care of her. And the little curly-headed Epi, the weaver's child, became an object of interest at several outlying homesteads, as well as in the village. Hitherto, he had been treated very much as if he had been a useful gnome or brownie, a queer and unaccountable creature who must necessarily be looked at with wandering curiosity and repulsion, and with whom one would be glad to make all greetings and bargains as brief as possible, but who must be dealt with in a proprietary way, and occasionally have a present of pork or garden stuff to carry home with him, seeing that without him there there was no getting the yarn woven. But now Silas met with open smiling faces and cheerful questioning, as a person whose satisfactions and difficulties could be understood. Everywhere he must sit and talk a little about the child, and words of interest were always ready for him. Ah, Mr Marner, you'd be lucky if she takes the measles soon and easy. Or, why isn't there many lone men that had been wishing to take up with a little one like that? But I reckon the weaving makes you handier than men as do outdoor work. You're partly as handy as a woman, for weaving comes next to spinning. Elderly masters, masters and mistresses, seated observantly in large kitchen armchairs, shook their heads over the difficulties attendant on rearing children, felt Epi's arms and legs and pronounced them remarkably firm, and told Silas that if she turned out well, which, however, there was no telling, it would be a fine thing for him to have a steady lass for it to do him when he got to do for him when he got helpless. Servant maidens were fond of carrying her out to look at the hens and chickens, or to see if any cherries could be shaken down in the orchard, and the small boys and girls approached her slowly, with cautious movement and steady gaze, like little dogs face to face with one of their own kind, till attraction had reached the point at which the soft lips were put out for a kiss. No child was afraid of approaching Silas when Epi was near him. There was no repulsion around him now, either for young or old, for the little child had come to link him once more with the whole world. There was love between him and the child that, that blent them into one, and there was love between the child and the world, from men and women with parental looks and tones to red ladybirds and the round pebbles. Silas began to think of Ravelo life entirely in relation to Epi. She must have everything that was good in Ravelo. 
and that he li and he listened docilely that he may come to understand better what this life was from which for 15 years he had stood aloof as if from a strange thing with which he could have no commission as some man who has precious plant to which he would give a nurturing home in a new soil thinks of the rain and sunshine sunshine and all influences in relation to his nursling and asks industriously for all knowledge that will help him to satisfy the wants of his searching roots or to guard leaf and bud from invading harm. The disposition to hoard had been utterly crushed at the very first by the loss of this long stored gold. The coins he earned afterwards seemed as irrelevant as stones baked, uh, stones brought to complete a house suddenly buried by an earthquake. The sense of bereavement was too heavy upon him for the old thrill of satisfaction to arise again at the touch of his newly earned coin. And now something had come to replace his hoard, which gave a growing purpose to the earnings, drawing his hope and joy continually onward beyond the money. In old days there were angels who came and took men by the hand and led them away from the city of destruction. We see no white-winged no white winged angels now, but yet men are led away from threatening destruction. A hand is put into theirs, which leads them forth gently towards a calm and bright land, so that they look no more backward, and the hand may be the little child's. End of chapter 14. And the next chapter is just one page. Chapter 15. There was one person as you will believe, who watched with keener, the more hidden interest than any other. The prosperous growth of Epi under the weaver's care. He dared not do anything that would imply a stronger interest in a poor man's adopted child than could be expected from the kindliness of the young squire. When a chance meeting suggested a little present to a simple old fellow whom others noted with goodwill. But he told himself that the time would come when he might do something towards furthering the welfare of his daughter without incurring suspicions. He was very uneasy in the meantime at his inability to give his daughter her birthright. I cannot say that he was. The child was being taken care of and would very likely be happy, as people in humble station often were, happier perhaps than those brought up in luxury. That famous ring that pricked its owner when he forgot Dusty and followed Desire I wonder if it pricked very hard when he set out on the chase, or whether it pricked but lightly then, and only pierced to the quick when the chase had long been ended, and hope, folding her wings, looked backwards and became regret. Godfrey Cass's cheek and eye were brighter now than ever. He was so undivided in his aims that he seemed like a man of firmness. No Dunsey had come back. People had made up their minds that he was gone for a soldier or gone out of the country and no one cared to be, to be specific in their inquiries on a delicate subject to a respectable family. Godfrey had ceased to see the shadow of Dunsey across his path, and the path now lay straight forward to the accomplishment of the best long-cherished wishes. Everybody said that Mr. Godfrey had taken the right turn, and it was pretty clear what would be the end of things, for there were not many ways in the week when he not many days in the week when he was not seen riding to the Warrens. Godfrey himself, when he was asked jocosely if the day had been fixed, smiled with the pleasant consciousness of a lover who would say yes if he liked. He felt a reformed man, delivered from temptation, and the visions of his future life seemed to him as a promised land for which he had no cause to fight. He saw himself with all his happiness centred on his own hearth while Nancy would smile on him as he played with the children. And that other child, not at the hearth, he would not forget it. He would see that it was well provided for. That was a father's duty. End of chapter 15. Now, that was part one. And this is part two. Strange, isn't it? We read all of that. Part one and that, and now just beginning part two. Hmm. Mm. What's going to happen? Is Godfrey always going to just let Silas, let Silas bring up his daughter? Mm. 
is she going to grow up and wonder where she came from? Interesting, interesting. Um, I'll read the next part in a while, I guess. In, um, well, maybe a few days, maybe a few weeks, who knows. But thank you for watching. Make sure you're subscribed to me here. Give me a, a follow and a like. And if you have a look at my bio.link slash a9630, that's bio.link slash a9630, you can find me on other places as well, such as Twitch and Twitter. And if you really, really wanted to, you could uh, send me some coffee. Use Buy Me A Coffee or KO-FI um, and send me a few dollars, a few pounds, whatever, whatever you wish to send me, if you want to, if you're enjoying, uh, enjoying listening. All right, so thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Cheerio, bye.